All right, we have come back together to uh, continue on screw tape, and we're on letter 15, if I remember right. That's what I had my pen in, uh, in the book. So I've got John Cleese ready for us. Let me boot him up. All the way to 15? I'm just... I think we are, aren't we? I don't, know. I don't remember. Uh, let's see. Okay, looks like we're going to be hitting chapter 14 and then move forward from there. So I will bring up uh, John Cleese and we'll get started. Now, tell me what you see. What do you see? Oh, John Cleese. YouTube, YouTube yeah. screen, yeah. Okay, that's good. Letter 14. Letter 14. My dear Wormwood, the most alarming thing in your last account of the patient is that he is making none of those confident resolutions which marked his original conversion. No more lavish promises of perpetual virtue, I gather. Not even the expectation of an endowment of grace for life, but only a hope for the daily and hourly pittance to meet the daily and hourly temptation. This is very bad. I see only one thing to do at the moment. Your patient has become humble. Have you drawn his attention to the fact? All virtues are less formidable to us once the man is aware that he has them. But this is especially true of humility. Catch him at the moment when he is really poor in spirit and smuggle into his mind the gratifying reflection, by Jove, I'm being humble. And almost immediately, pride, pride at his own humility, will appear. If he awakes to the danger and tries to smother this new form of pride, make him proud of his attempt, and so on through as many stages as you please. But don't try this for too long, for fear you awake his sense of humour and proportion, in which case he will merely laugh at you and go to bed. But there are other profitable ways of fixing his attention on the virtue of humility. By this virtue, as by all the others, our enemy wants to turn the man's attention away from self to him and to the man's neighbours. All the abjection and self-hatred are designed in the long run solely for this end. Unless they attain this end, they do us little harm. And they may even do us good if they keep the man concerned with himself. And above all, if self-contempt can be made the starting point for contempt of other selves, and thus for gloom, cynicism, and cruelty. You must therefore conceal from the patient the true end of humility. Let him think of it not as self-forgetfulness, but as a certain kind of opinion, namely a low opinion, of his own talents and character. Some talents, I gather, he really has. Fix in his mind the idea that humility consists in trying to believe those talents to be less valuable than he believes them to be. No doubt they are, in fact, less valuable than he believes, but that is not the point. The great thing is to make him value an opinion for some quality other than truth, thus introducing an element of dishonesty and make-believe into the heart of what otherwise threatens to become a virtue. By this method, thousands of humans have been brought to think that humility means pretty women trying to believe that they're ugly, and clever men trying to believe they are fools. And since what they are trying to believe may, in some cases, be manifest nonsense, they cannot succeed in believing it. And we then have the chance of keeping their minds endlessly revolving on themselves in an effort to achieve the impossible. To anticipate the enemy's strategy, we must consider his aims. The enemy wants to bring the man to a state of mind in which he could design the best cathedral in the world and know it to be the best and rejoice in the fact without being any more or less or otherwise glad at having done it than he would be if it had been done by another. The enemy wants him, in the end, to be so free from any bias in his own favour that he can rejoice in his own talents as frankly and gratefully as in his neighbour's talents, or in a sunrise, an elephant, or a waterfall. He wants each man, in the long run, to be able to recognise all creatures, even himself, as glorious and excellent things. He wants to kill their animal self-love as soon as possible. But it is his long-term policy, I fear, to restore to them a new kind of self-love, a charity and <laughs> gratitude for all selves, including their own. When they have really learned to love their neighbours as themselves, 
they will be allowed to love themselves as their neighbours, for we must never forget what is the most repellent and inexplicable trait in our enemy. He really loves the hairless bipeds he has created and always gives back to them with his right hand what he has taken away with his left. Ugh. His whole effort, therefore, will be to get the man's mind off the subject of his own value altogether. He would rather the man thought himself a great architect or a great poet and then forgot about it than that he should spend much time and pains trying to think himself a bad one. Your efforts to instill either vainglory or false modesty into the patient will therefore be met from the enemy's side with the obvious reminder that a man is not usually called upon to have an opinion of his own talents at all since he can very well go on improving them to the best of his ability without deciding on his own precise niche in the temple of fame. You must try to exclude this reminder from the patient's consciousness at all costs. The enemy will also try to render real in the patient's mind a doctrine which they all profess but find it difficult to bring home to their feelings. The doctrine that they did not create themselves, that their talents were given them, and that they might as well be proud of the colour of their hair. But always, and by all methods, the enemy's aim will be to get the patient's mind off such questions, and yours will be to fix it on them. Even of his sins, the enemy does not want him to think too much. Once they are repented, the sooner the man turns his attention outward, the better the enemy is pleased. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. I'm going to make a bold statement and say that doing a 10 tenex... All right, let's see what we got. So this one is a very good chapter. So is 15 and so is 16. Lots and lots of fun. Did anything stand out to you as we as he went through this? Anything catch your ear? I like in the first paragraph here how he uses the words daily and hourly, daily and hourly at the very beginning. This uh, I gather not even the expectation of an endowment of grace for life, but only hope for a daily and hourly pittance to meet the daily and hourly temptation. This is very bad. So this is that that uh, um, lesson that Jesus is constantly trying to teach to get the people in front of him. Come on. To get the people in front of him to um, stop thinking and doing what they think other people want them to yeah, do. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. <laughs> that was hurting my head. Yeah, sorry about that. We're looking at it. You know how Jesus is asking the people questions all the time. That's his ministry. He doesn't uh, give them answers. He asks them questions. And the questions are at their root designed to get them to think about their own head. So he says, well, you know, what do you think? And then in that moment, like you and I do, um, when he says, what do you think? We start to formulate a thought, and in, in you know in nanoseconds, we are going through our filing cabinet, thinking about who we heard it, where we heard it, how long ago we heard it, um, what the opposite is, what's the, the chance of it happening. So we have all these facts rushing around, so we can say, this is what I think, or this is what I believe, and this is how I got there. So what Jesus is asking them to do is to, he, he asked them a question, what do you, you know, what do you think about that? And he doesn't want them to, that, well, they can't go straight to the answer. He wants them to focus on the process that starts in their head. Reviewing why I'm going to answer the answer I'm going to give you. And if you think about the, the Pharisees and Sadducees in the scripture, remember they constantly say the Pharisees came out to trick him or to catch him in a lie or catch him in a question or something. So he asks them a question so that when they review the question in their head, they have to go straight to that point where well, how am I going to answer it in order I can catch him? So it's not an honest, it's not an honest exchange. And he wants them to see this as an as a dishonest exchange and decide not to do it. Decide to come clean and be honest. So this is that living in the moment thing. So the, the Pharisees were thinking about what's going to happen in an hour when I get back to the temple and the high priest comes to me and Asked me what I said and what I did, and I can't answer. He's going to, he's going to kick me out of the temple. And they're thinking about a week from now when they say and do this thing, and then they get a promotion, 
perhaps, or a recognition from the high priest. And they're thinking about a month from now when all of creation falls apart because of this itinerant preacher, because that's what the high priest said. They're not thinking about right now, I'm looking at a person uh, in front of me that I know is more than a person. And they're refusing to see that, refusing to engage at that level. And that's where he constantly tries to get people to go. It's a problem that we have, and we're going to get into it in the next chapter. The um, living in the moment is really hard for us. It's much harder than we think it is. So he kicks it, kicks the door in right there at the front. Um, and I like this line. He says, all virtues are less formidable to us once the man is aware that he has them, but especially true about humility. Catch him when he does that thing. He says, um, make him aware that he's humble and being proud that he's humble. <laughs> yeah. Because he'll just laugh at you and go to bed. Um, I think that's on a... For baby Christians, for Christian people who just become Christians, that is a real thing. Where, because you're, the person's trying to be a Christian, trying to be a good Christian. And the person knows that to be a good Christian means to be humble, because that's, they've heard that, right? Mm -hmm. So then when they're humble, they think about how humble they're being and how they're, they're fitting into the mold of a good Christian. And they feel good about being humble, yeah. because now they're closer into the group, because they're being a good Christian. So it's a real true thing, and as it would be, because remember that what Lewis is really doing is he's talking about his own experience of conversion to Christianity. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, so then he goes to humility, this whole thing about humility. You must therefore conceal from the patient the true end of humility. Let him think of it not as self-forgetfulness, but as a certain kind of opinion, namely a low opinion of his own talents and character. Yeah, so it's it's a instead of a, a lack of something, it's an introducing a new positive uh energy. So I'm I'm sitting back here saying I I don't want to go to the front of the food line because I think all these people are great and then go to the front of the food line. I'm still gonna get food. I mean, unless they don't have any food when I get there, but I think I'm going to get food, so it's not a big deal. That's that's not thinking of the self. I'm just I'm just waiting. The opposite is saying, oh, I'm going to be, I'll wait at the back because that's what good, humble people do. They wait at the back of the room and don't go first. So I'm going to do that, and that'll get me some brownie points because other people will look at him and say, oh, he's in the back because he's so humble. Isn't that great? So he's saying, add in this, uh, and this, and this element of of um, thinking about thinking about it and not doing it. You know, making it a a, a process or a uh, an achievement in my life to get this done. Um, I was talking to a young man a little while ago who, uh, you know, just volunteered on the bus that, that over Christmas. He was at his grandmother's house with the whole family. There are like 25 people from what I understood. And he says, and after dinner, I got up and I helped take the dishes to the kitchen. I said, really? He said, yeah, yeah, I did. I took them to the kitchen. And I said, well, do you not normally do that? He goes, no, no, but I did it this time. Everybody saw me. <laughs> Proud of me. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, um, he's doing, he did the right thing because his mom always tells him to take the dishes to the kitchen. But he doesn't do it at home. He just did it in front of the 25 family members so that he could look like a really good kid. He did it when there were people watching. Yeah. Yep. That's a uh, member of St. Paul talks about that. He says his criticism of the of the uh, uh, people he's talking to are is that they want to be seen of men. Yes. That they want to be noticed. That they're, he's calling into question their um, honesty in being the person that they're being because their their goal is to be seen by people. You know, this is the this is the cry of hypocrisy that we that we launch at politicians. You know, out, out here they're this kind of person. You know darn well what they're like back there. Yeah, and that cracks yeah. bigger as the days go by. Two phase, three phase, <laughs> etc. Yeah, I think by the dozen actually. Well, yeah. Okay, so this one he says um, some talents I gather he really has. Fix his mind on the idea that humility exists of trying to believe. Those talents are less valuable than than they than uh, he believes them to be. Um, and then this one, the great thing is to make him value an opinion 
for some quality other than truth, thus introducing a dishonesty and make-believe at the heart of the, which otherwise threatens to be a, a virtue. So this, um, I'm, I'm valuing your opinion. We're having a discussion and I'm valuing your opinion, not because I agree with you or I think you're right, but because I want you to help me clean my garage on Saturday. <laughs> right. So I'm going to get a little closer to you and, and uh, we're going to become really good buddies on the Thursday night so that we can go, you know, I can call you up on Friday night and say, Hey, Oh, by the way, can you give me a hand cleaning my garage? So, I'll buy pizza. Yeah. There's a dishonesty that's built into it. I'm not doing it for, for genuinely wanting to know you or what you think it's because I want something out of you. And it's not malicious at this level, at this level, it's just, you know, one thing for another, but it's, not truthful it's, it's dishonest and you want to become malicious every time oh yeah absolutely you become a, a gamesman usury um and this 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 whole you know this whole section right here, he says since they're trying to believe what they're trying to believe in may in some cases be nonsense they cannot succeed in believing it uh, we have a chance to keep their minds endlessly revolving on themselves in an effort to achieve the impossible this is that thing that says, you know, um, uh, someone says, oh, you're so good looking. Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, just terrible. Um, definition of humility I've got written down here. I wrote it down in the corner. It says, uh, yep, the enemy wants to bring a man to a state of mind in which he could design the best cathedral in the world and know it to be the best and rejoice in the fact without being more or less or otherwise glad at having done it that he'd be just as glad if somebody else did it. You know, no, really, in reality, absolutely no attachment to the to the praise and, and accolades. Just happy to be doing what he's doing, and he'd be happy if you did it. Happy to do it, and don't really need credit for it. Yep. And, and he wants in the end to have a, you know, case of his, uh, he wants them, each man in the long run to be able to recognize all creatures, even himself, as glorious and excellent things. He wants to kill their animal self-love, which is sin, right? yeah. That's sin, as soon as possible. But his long-term policy up here is to restore them to a new kind of self-love, charity, and gratitude for all people, including themselves. Uh, when they have learned to love their neighbors and themselves, they will be able to love themselves as their neighbor. So what does that mean? I mean that's, a, that's actually a pretty big statement to unpack in Scripture. Um, he says, uh, you have to love your neighbor as yourself. So very few times can a person say they hate themselves. I'm, I'm disappointed in myself. I wish I had done a better job. I know why I'm disappointed in myself because I didn't apply myself or I didn't get up on time because, well, I have to go deep into that one because I certainly could have gotten up on time, but I didn't. So it had to be on purpose, which means I probably really don't want the job. So I stayed home. You know how that goes. You really didn't want to be at the dinner. And if you're just there late, you know, what can you do? Um, so this is, so we're not really, we can't hate ourselves. We can see ourselves as a project and work on ourselves, uh, but we can hate our neighbor. We can hate the other. Remember that when Jesus is talking, he's talking about everybody, not the guy over the fence. You know, he's talking about everyone that we think about and talk about. And this is that crazy thing. I just watched a little bit of the Congress. I should stop doing that because actually I'm getting really desensitized to it. Um, there are people in there screaming about, you know, actually, one of the one of one of them just brought up Jesus in the middle of the thing. Like, you know, this is what we need to do, and Jesus would have it this way. And I'm thinking, what part of love your neighbor as yourself is are you exhibiting right now? That right, and of course, right after that sentence, she starts saying, uh, you know, you people this and you people that, and accusing them. And the then the the, mm -hmm. uh, the the chairman has to hit the gavel and say, point of order, you cannot attack the other congressman. We don't do that here. So for all of this, I'm a Christian and I, you know, the, the love your neighbor as yourself is just not there. And Jesus gives absolutely no quarter on that. Remember he said, um, you've heard it said, uh, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I say, love your neighbor and love those who persecute you and pray for them. And I think I, you heard me in a sermon or a story I told you that uh, I was online with a person who was quite objectionable and was throwing up, throwing up, throwing out 
uh, Jesus statements all over the place about how this is for God and this is for Jesus and this is over this and this. And I said, well, what do you do with the, sen the saying that you should love, uh, love your enemy and pray for him? And he said, that's, that's not in the Bible. I said, yes, it is in the Bible. <laughs> he said, I don't know what, he said, you must not be a very good priest because you don't know what's in the Bible and what's not in the Bible. And, you know, you, you've got your own Bible. It's written in there. You probably have it your own. You probably wrote it in there. Somebody wrote it in there. And I said, do you have a Bible? He said, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> okay. When we get off, you go get your Bible. And I quoted it to him. It's in Matthew. I said, look it up. Not my Bible. Your Bible. Look it up. And just to make sure when we go offline, I I went to a, on the internet and I copied the passage out. I, I stuck it in an email with all these citations over and sent it to him. And for the next two weeks or three weeks that we were on, uh, I kept asking him when the, when the conversation went, there's probably 25 people in this chat, this, this uh, group. I said, you know, hey, hey, what uh, did you think about that scripture that we were talking about the other day about loving your enemy? Would, wouldn't answer, ever. Would not answer. And within two weeks, he was back to saying the same stuff he was saying before. So it's all fake. You know, it's all just a tool. It's a tool. And that's exactly what Screw Tape is saying here. You know, let them do the things that they're doing for all the for all the motives other than the correct one, and then they won't even notice it after a point in time. It just becomes what they do. So let's see. Oh, let's see. Um, your efforts to instill vainglory or false modesty into the patient. Will therefore be met by the enemy's side an obvious reminder that the man is not usually called upon to have an opinion of his own talents at all. You must try to exclude this reminder from the patient's consciousness at all costs. So he's again wants to keep the person's mind not on themselves, right? He wants to keep the mind. Well, it sounds counterintuitive, but he's saying if I'm not supposed to have, we're not supposed to have an opinion of ourselves, right? I am. I am who I am. I'm not going to go to you and say, hey. hey. Alan, I'm a really great guy. <laughs> you know, I'm really terrific, and uh, I really, I play a mean banjo, and I'm a really, you know, you should come to see me because I'm so wonderful. And we don't do that. So he's saying, in, in, in this instance, you want to keep the man thinking about that, thinking about how he's not, doesn't have an opinion about himself, and counting that as a positive. I'm humble because I'm not this person, but he's not answering because he's not, doesn't have an opinion. He's not answering because that uh, is what humble people do. Right. You know, actually, all of our politicians do that, though. Yes. They are the best. Yes, they are the best. Trump and some of them, you just, I can take care of it. I can do it all. Yeah, they're doing it for you. Yeah. I'm doing it for you. You're the one. I'm the, yes. only, the reason I'm doing this is for you. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta love it. Um, our job is to keep the patient's mind off these kind of things, and yours is to keep them fixed on it. And remember, all of this revolves around not living in the moment like the Pharisee is standing in front of Jesus. I can't answer this question, honestly, if I think about it. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. Every All my criteria for answering the question is out there in the front, someplace. What will they think of me? What will they say about me? I'm going to answer thinking about what's going to happen then. And that's what really gets the ball rolling for 15. So you want to roll into 15? Sure. It's really 15. It's just a continuation of 14. Yeah. Really moves in. Well, let's see. 15. These commercial things, I'll tell you. That's a game. Do you hear that sound? <laughs> it's, a, it's a game advertisement. All right, let's see. Let up 15. Okay. 15. My dear Wormwood, I had noticed, of course, that the humans were having a lull in their European war, what they naively call the war, and I'm not surprised that there is a corresponding lull in the patient's anxiety. Do we want to encourage this or to keep him worried? Tortured fear and stupid confidence are both desirable states of mind. Our choice between them raises important questions. The humans live in time. 
but our enemy destines them to eternity. He therefore, I believe, wants them to attend chiefly to two things, to eternity itself and to that point of time which they call the present. For the present is the point at which time touches eternity, of the present moment and of it only. Humans have an experience analogous to the experience which our enemy has of reality as a whole. In it alone, freedom and actuality are offered them. He would therefore have them continually concerned either with eternity, which means being concerned with him, or with the present either meditating on their eternal union with or separation from himself or else obeying the present voice of conscience, bearing the present cross, receiving the present grace, giving thanks for the present pleasure. Our business is to get them away from the eternal and from the present. With this in view, we sometimes tempt a human, say a, a widow or a scholar, to live in the past. But this is of limited value, for they have some real knowledge of the past, and it has a determinate nature and to that extent resembles eternity. It is far better to make them live in the future. Biological necessity makes all their passions point in that direction already, so that thought about the future inflames hope and fear. Also, it is unknown to them, so that in making them think about it, we make them think of unrealities. In a word, the future is, of all things, the thing least like eternity. It is the most completely temporal part of time. The past is frozen and no longer flows, and the present is all lit up with eternal rays. Hence the encouragement we have given to all those schemes of thought such as creative evolution, scientific humanism or communism, which fix men's affections on the future, on the very core of temporality. Hence, nearly all vices are rooted in the future. Gratitude looks to the past and love to the present. Fear, avarice, lust and ambition look ahead. Do not think lust an exception. When the present pleasure arrives, the sin which alone interests us is already over. The pleasure is just a part of the process which we regret and would exclude if we could do so without losing the sin. It is the part contributed by the enemy and therefore experienced in a present. The sin, which is our contribution, looked forward. To be sure, the enemy wants men to think of the future too, just so much as is necessary for now planning the acts of justice or charity, which will probably be their duty tomorrow. The duty of planning the morrow's work is today's duty. Though its material is borrowed from the future, the duty, like all duties, is in the present. This is now straw splitting. <laughs> He does not want men to give the future their hearts to place their treasure in it. We do. His ideal is a man who, having worked all day for the good of posterity, if that is his vocation, washes his mind of the whole subject, commits the issue to heaven, and returns at once to the patience or gratitude demanded by the moment that is passing over him. But we want a man hag-ridden by the future, haunted by visions of an imminent heaven or hell upon earth ready to break the enemy's commands in the present, if by doing so we make him think he can attain the one or avert the other, dependent for his faith on the success or failure of schemes whose end he will not live to see. We want a whole race perpetually in pursuit of the rainbow's end, never honest nor kind nor happy now, but always using as mere fuel wherewith to heap on the altar of the future every real gift which is offered them in the present. It follows then, in general, and other things being equal, that it is better for your patient to be filled with anxiety or hope, doesn't much matter which, about this war than for him to be living in the present. But the phrase, living in the present, is ambiguous. It may describe a process which is really just as much concerned with the future as anxiety itself. Your man may be 
untroubled about the future, not because he is concerned with the present, but because he has persuaded himself that the future is going to be agreeable. As long as that is the real course of his tranquility, his tranquility will do us good, because it is only piling up more disappointment and therefore more impatience for him when his false hopes are dashed. If, on the other hand, he is aware that horrors may be in store for him and is praying for the virtues wherewith to meet them and meanwhile concerning himself with the present because there and there alone all duty, all grace, all knowledge and all pleasure dwell, his state is very undesirable and should be attacked at once. Here again, our philological arm has done good work. Try the word complacency on him. But of course, it is most likely that he is living in the present for none of these reasons, but simply because his health is good and he is enjoying his work. The phenomenon would then be merely natural. All the same, I should break it up if I were you. No natural phenomenon is really in our favour. And anyway, why should the creature be happy? Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. All right, you see how it keeps going. It's uh, it's just the second half of uh, of fourteen. So we we can pay, spend a lot of time here, but I don't think we have to. If we're really, he's really driving this whole thing home. Um, uh, he has some real zinger lines in here. I'm gonna have to pull you back to because they're great. One of them I say all the time. I use it in so many conversations. It is this uh, line that says the duty of planning you know, tomorrow's work is today's duty. So what people do is they get stuck in their plan. So I write out on the whiteboard that I've got to go and get the tires rotated on the car and check the spare because I think it's going flat because I keep getting that little alarm on the dashboard that says my tires are low. But I keep checking my tires and my tires aren't low. And suddenly I realized, oh, I've got a flat. It's, 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 the, it's, the, it's the spare tire. So I put that on the board. I got to go tomorrow and get, get the tires looked at. And then when I sit down for dinner an hour later, Jenny says, oh, you okay? What's wrong? I said, well, you know what? Tomorrow, if I, I'm going to go get the, the, what if that tire's flat? I, I don't know. I got, then I have to think of, do I, do I, do I buy a new a tire? Uh, do I try to get this one fixed? I mean, I've gotten new tires since I got that, since the spare was on. So it doesn't match the tires on the truck. Oh uh, man. You know, and then the money, I mean, is there a discount? Maybe I should wait and look at the paper, look on the online, see if I can get a 10% discount and get the tires later. But then if, if I don't get a tire and I have a flat, I'm going to be out of luck. And you know, it's probably going to happen. That's the one time you get a flat is when you don't have a spare. You see how it goes. Suddenly, I've got this thing I've got to do tomorrow, but I'm living in this huge building anxiety process tonight. So I've taken the duty of tomorrow and put it on the wall, but I haven't let it go. I've held on to it. And I make it a part of all of my, my conversations and I make it a part of what's going on and my, my attitude turns sour at night and I don't I'm have fun with it. I don't pet the dog and I don't have pleasant conversation with my kids and become sullen and angry and everything else. So this all is, not tired. yeah, <laughs> it's the planning of, it's the, and, and of course what we're doing here is not living in the moment, right? I'm not living now, I'm living tomorrow for fear of what's gonna happen when I get to discount tire and haven't checked my tires. So the, what's happening tomorrow is ruining tonight and it hasn't happened yet. What if I get killed on the way to discount tire? Well, the last thing in the world that's gonna happen is that my family's gonna remember me sullen and upset and, and haggard and not wanting to play and do this other stuff. That This has actually happened. And uh, uh, there was a man, this is 25 years ago who I knew briefly who um, was having, he was a, a worrier and he was having a problem at work. He'd been over, he'd been overlooked for promotion a couple of times. He worked downtown, a white collar. And uh, he decided he was going to go in on Saturday to, to do some more work because the promotions were going to be announced late in the week, the next week. Well, on Friday, when he got home with all the tales of his perception that his manager was favoring the other guy, he was a holy terror. He yelled at his kids, you know, picked his dog, was mean to his wife, didn't eat dinner with the family, uh, stayed up late, came to bed, pushed away the wife and all this other stuff. And then he got in the car the next morning and took off for for the uh, uh, for downtown. He got hit 
by a log truck. Oh. And was killed. Oh. No promotion. <laughs> and the last thing that his his uh, kids have to remember was that dad was this mean guy who wouldn't eat dinner with them and yelled at mom. Mm -hmm. So he let everything happening tomorrow ruin the present, and the present is all he had. He didn't have anything else. That was it. So Jesus says that all the time. He says, you know, don't lose the moment you're living in. Because if you do, you may never get it back. Well, you'll never get it back, but you may never get another chance to get beyond it. Uh, this whole thing about the future, I love this whole explanation. It's worth, you know, cutting out and putting on the wall about um, the past, the future, and eternity. About the, you know, people, my mother, my father died when I was 13. And after all the kids got out of the house, you know, they're up and, and away. Mom started becoming a recluse she was absolutely a recluse by the time she died and uh, uh she had she just lived in in her mind and in her heart uh with my dad mm -hmm. she wasn't she wasn't uh, delusional but um that was her happy time that was her fulfillment you know we were little dad was there and when my mom and dad had this stellar stellar life together relationship one of those fairy tale relationships so um that's where she lived. That's that's that was it, you know. And I went there, and I was happy for her that at least she was happy, you know, living in the past. So it she she didn't miss the moments that much, but she did, and uh, I I gave made allowances for her because you know I I, I wanted want her to be in pain and be sorrowing, but it wasn't uh, uh it wasn't necessary. She could have lived more in the present, and gotten the joy out of the present things like the grandkids and us and she wouldn't travel she wouldn't go anywhere you know she just stayed kind of locked up and that separated her from from what she could have been doing so very sad people living in the past but remember he says that's he's saying that's not too successful because they they have a memory you know my mom was happy with the past now he's saying no 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 keep them in the future the future like that guy at the truck right the future, all these things he says right here, fear, avarice, lust, and ambition. Think about them for a minute. None of those exist in the present. I don't fear in the present. I have an emotional fear of the future. I'm not as scared right now. I'm sitting in my chair. But if there's somebody lurking around the window and I see them, I'm still okay. I'm in my chair. But what I'm afraid of is that they're going to get in the house. They're not in the house yet. But I'm afraid they're going to get in the house. So my fear is of the future, the possible future that they're going to break in the house. I don't realize it's my grandson <laughs> who came over. You know, I don't have any reason to be afraid at all, right? But I am afraid because the future, avarice, the same thing. You know, I'm looking for fulfillment for my machinations. That's all in the future. Uh, ambition, same thing. That's that guy that got killed. His ambition was to get promoted, living in the future, missing the past. And lust, lust, I think, is, a, is probably the poster child for living in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, and this great thing he says right here, when the pleasant pleasure arrives, the sin, which alone interests us, is already over. The pleasure is just part of the process, which we regret and would exclude if we could. The sin, which is our contribution to look forward, the enemy, therefore, experiences in a present. So the pleasure is the present that's given by God. It is the sin is the lust that's be, that led to the pleasure. Now, you can say, well, the pleasure is not is an incorrect pleasure, right? So now I'm, I don't know, cheating on my wife. So that's, pleasure is bad. Well, no, it's not. This is, the, this is the confusing thing. The pleasure is not bad because God gives us pleasure. Like, I love drinking this water. That's the pleasure. I don't hate drinking the water. I love drinking the water. God has given us the ability to love things, to have experiences that are delightful and wonderful, to smell roses and flowers and see beautiful birds fly and feel good about it. That's all from God. But we can mismanage that love and that gift. We can apply that gift and receive the pleasure from something we should not be doing. So the pleasure is God's, but it's been tainted by the process around it. So we're actually, it's like taking the gift and, and belittling it. And we still receive the gift. I still have it, but it's, I'm not uh, being truly thankful for it. I'm actually um, uh, misusing the gift and, and not giving the, the giver credit for it. 
So he it's it's all working up to it. It's all the future. And this is if you know anybody who is uh, addicted to I don't know process. I know a lot of people are addicted to process. Um, I know a, a gentleman who is a, he's literally addicted to crisis. He he needs a crisis manager, which is great. But he learned early on that he thrived when there was a crisis. It was what made him feel alive, you know, like like race car drivers. They only feel alive when they're in the race car. Um, so he angles all of his life toward finding crisis. And if there isn't one, he makes one. He creates crisis in his life so that he can come to the rescue and solve the crisis because he has to he has to have it. So his life is a mess. Um, the not to him, but the people around him. That's why he's talking with me. Okay, let's see. Uh, we want a hag written. We want a man hag written with the future, haunted by visions of an imminent heaven or hell upon earth, ready to break the enemy's commands in the present. If so, by doing, he may think he may attain one or the other uh, in the future, but in the present when it comes. Uh, perpetual suit of the rainbow's end. He talks about that. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Your man may be un uh, the future. Okay, that wonderful little twist. I'm sure that it's going to be okay. I'm not worried about it. Tomorrow, it's going to be fine. Well, that's a fantasy. I, I don't know if it's going to be fine. I have no idea. If I am looking tomorrow, I've had this at weddings. This happens at weddings a lot. Um, so they, you know, they're that night, they're worried about tomorrow. You know, the bride's worried, the groom's a little worried. What's going to happen tomorrow? What to make it work all right? And I always hear the family members saying, It's going to be fine, it's going to be beautiful, it's going to be great. Don't worry about it, it's terrific. I did a wedding where it was a complete, <laughs> they had yeah. it outside. Oh my gosh, it was outside in the park and it poured rain. Yeah. We had to move into this bunkhouse within a state park, and and de and they wanted to decorate the entire bunkhouse mm. while we're supposed to be getting married. Like the wedding was at six o'clock, and we're in there drenched with water, hanging little chapstick oh, to make their wedding. And the mother, one of the mothers, was over in the back just crying because. And I'd heard her say this at the reception, you know, because we're all saying, or at the rehearsal, we were all saying last night. It, hey, you know, it's close to rain tomorrow. She's like, no, no, it's going to be fine. It's not going to rain. It's going to be, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> rain, and she's over there crying. And she, you know what happens when that happens with the mother? A whole bunch of people go over to console the mom. So the people that could have been helping out. Yeah. Now, yeah. yeah. They're over there, not helping. <laughs> and it makes everybody else feel bad because she's tormented in the corner. All right, let's finish this. Um, philosophical arms does good work. The word complacency. Complacency's um, a classic definition is satisfaction with self. Mm -hmm. You know, we usually think of or often think of complacency as meaning that we don't care. Well, it's meaning you don't want to improve at all. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it, well, it goes to that thing. So it's just okay with me. Mm -hmm. You think it's okay with me. Whatever you want to do, you know, it's, it's really just I'm I'm just satisfied with my thing and I don't want to make any effort to help you with your thing. So just whatever you want to do. I don't want to go, I don't want to go on record. I don't want to commit. <laughs> um complacency, satisfaction with self. Speaking of the future, okay. The phenomenon would be oh and I love the little thing where he says, no natural phenomenon is really in our favor. I'd break it up anyway. I like the little if you're if you're a demon and you can't have some fun sometimes needling the small stuff and what's the point. And okay, now, even. so now, so the big takeaway for 14 and 15 is living in the moment. That's the whole thing is living in the moment. Um, not, you know, making the plan for tomorrow. And when you get done making the plan, don't worry about it anymore. Go have fun. Go do something different, but don't, don't stress about it. There's nothing you can do uh, you know, I just listened to, oh, it was Dust in the Wind, right? Yeah. yeah. I just listened to it on the way home uh, when I came home a little while ago, where he says, um, 
not a, all your money, not another minute will buy, will buy, right? So mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what happens tomorrow. There's nothing I can do about it. It's gonna it's gonna arrive the way it's gonna arrive, and that's just gonna be it. So if I'm okay with that right now, and that's what Jesus is constantly trying to do. He says, if if you're living in me, if you're living in my father, if you're living with um this kind of egalitarian love for yourself, for the for the uh, for, the, for the, the Godhead, for the Trinity, and for the other, then I'm living in the moment. I'm praying in the moment. I'm living, I'm dealing with the people and loving the people in front of me in the moment. And what happens tomorrow, if it's horrible, what am I going to do? I'm going to be living in the moment. So I'm going to be loving the people in, this, in the problem. I'm going to be loving myself in the process of loving them in the moment. I'm going to be praying in the moment to God. And we're going to live through the moment. And the best thing I can do for everybody is to be that person that loves and lives in the moment and doesn't get caught up in the fervor and the craze of, oh, no, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. That's all the fear. Even, even when it goes bad, there's a fear on top of it. And that's constantly what Jesus is saying. You will not be afraid. You will not be anxious. You will not be hurt. You not, will not have these things happen to you if you live in the moment. And if you love me and you love yourself, you'll be fine. You'll be able to help other people and not be broken by it. Bill, he was talking about uh, World War II a little yep. bit there. Yep. And he said, don't worry about it. It yep. seemed like people would have been very worried about it, especially in the British Isles with bombs and yes, the blitz and everything and whatever. Uh, let's see. It says I had noticed, of course, the humans have been uh, having a lull in their European war, what they naively call the war, and I'm not surprised that there is a corresponding lull in the patient's anxieties. Do we want to encourage this or keep him worried? Tortured fear and stupid confidence are both desirable states of mind. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's um, again. So the. So in its absolute form, we put ourselves in the place. So I'm a I'm living in France. You know, uh, Germans are over the hill. I don't yeah. know if our army is going to stop them. Um, I am afraid of what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, that's my that's on my to my list. Why I'm afraid because this they're going to come here. So what do I do in the moment to address this possibility of action taking place tomorrow? Do I stay here? And pretend it's not going to happen and make bread? <laughs> or do I get my family and get out of here? Because the duty of tomorrow is that my family is okay. So I'm going to start doing that right now. Um, if, I, if I sit in my house and I'm just scared about tomorrow and I don't do anything, I'm not living in the moment, I'm not taking any, any, any steps in the moment to make a difference in my life and life of my family, then tomorrow they're going to be here. And there's not going to be anything I can do about it. So... The fear is real. The, it's We can't get away from fear. It's part of us. That's the animal nature he was talking about. That's the sin nature. So how do we overcome it or how do we manage it? And, that, and the answer to that is living in the moment. So I recognize the fear is about the future. How do I address the fear in the moment? What can I do so that that, that fear will not be a part of, will not define my life right now? So and the man in my story... Uh, he he couldn't do anything on Friday night. He had nothing he could do in his mind on Friday night. So he's so wrapped up about what's going to happen next week that he's just mean and nasty to his whole family. Well, if you could go back in time and talk to him, I wish I, I was I keep thinking I wish he'd called me. Um, I would have said, "Can you get in the car and go to work right now and take care of this stuff?" And he would say, "No." I said, "Then go and hug your child." Go and look in your wife's eyes. Sit down and pet your dog and live in the moment. Do you have any pie? Go eat some pie. You know, do something that makes you feel good and live right now in the moment. You cannot do a thing about what's going to happen next week. Tomorrow morning, because he he wanted to go. We, he told his wife he's going. That was part of the problem. She didn't want him to go to work, and there was an argument there. Little one. But when she started to say, don't go, what he heard in his head was, you're not... I don't care if you're promoted. So 
But that was part of his anxiety, right? So now he's like, you don't care about me. You don't care about my job. I've been overlooked and blah, blah, blah. So uh, I'd say, you know, right now, tonight, you can't be in your office. And you're going tomorrow. So tomorrow, you're going to be doing something to work on what's happening next Wednesday or Thursday. So you that's the plan. That's the duty. It's up there on the wall. Leave, go to work tomorrow. <laughs> and work for Wednesday, but right now, you can't do that. So right now, just live right now. Love your family, watch the TV, pet your dog, eat pie, have a good night's sleep. Uh, it, you can't do it. So you you take the fear for tomorrow, you recognize it, I have this fear. This is what the, Jesus was saying to the Pharisees, right? He asked them the question, in their mind they're going, if I don't do the right thing, the high priest is gonna kick me out of the temple. So they do this thing. So he's saying, Jesus was, if he could get in his mind, he'd say, stop that. Don't be worried about the high priest tomorrow. Worry about, think about what you, you need to do right now. What's the most important thing for you and for the life that you're living right now? Is it pleasing the high priest so something may or may not happen in two weeks? Or is it recognizing your salvation standing in front of you? You can't do that if you don't live in the moment. You're tied up with this other thing. It all hinges so much of the gospel over and over now. You never forget it. From now on, whenever you hear the gospel and you hear Jesus talking and asking questions, think about him. The only thing, the main thing he's trying to do is get the people he's talking to to ask themselves the questions and answer them in the moment. That's it. And they don't. They won't. And that's the sadness. Okay, so thank you so much for waiting. I'm again sorry about all that uh, um, updating. I should have gotten on hours, but I I zoomed in here at six o'clock, sat down for dinner, and then jumped up and came down here at twenty of, and that's when it all fell apart. Okay, I will I will have to get better at starting this whole thing up at like six and okay. see what the yeah. problem is. All right, guys. All right. God bless. Look forward to uh, 16. It's a different animal in a lot of different ways. It's going to be kind of fun. Okay. All right. Have a great night. You too. You too. Happy uh -huh. birthday, Mom. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.